Good afternoon and welcome to the Alex webinar. This is 2CUL, Cornell Columbia Next Gen Tech Services. I am Kristen Martin, a member of the Alex Continuing Education Committee. Our presenters today are Scott Wicks and Bob Wolven. Scott is the head of Information and Technical Services at the Harvard Library. He has a long history of working collaboratively to develop products and workflows that optimize staff resources. His 23-year tenure at Cornell University afforded him many opportunities to work across functional areas within the institution and also to consider radical collaboration across institutions through the Mellon-funded 2COL initiative with Columbia University. He holds an MLS from the University of Buffalo and an MBA from Cornell University and Queen's University. Bob has worked at Columbia University since 1972 in capacities ranging from chemistry librarian to serials cataloger to director of systems and to his current position as an AUL. He is a frequent speaker and writer on issues related to cataloging policy, metadata, and technical services in libraries, and has served on planning and advisory groups for the Library of Congress, Digital Library Federation, the Hockey Trust, and the RLG partnerships, among others. If you have questions for Bob, for Scott and Bob during the presentation, please type them into the question box on your screen, and then they will do their best to answer them at the conclusion of the presentation, but you're welcome to type them anytime. Also, please note the session is going to be recorded, and you'll receive an email after the conclusion of the webinar with a link to the recording. At that point, you'll also receive a copy of Scott and Bob's slides. Now the presentation will be turned over to Scott, and there may be a slight delay as we do this. Hello, this is Scott. Um, you may be wondering why I look so surprised. Uh, I have some full disclosure. As uh, Kristen mentioned, uh, I'm no longer with Cornell. I'm now with Harvard Library. But about a year ago, Bob Wolven and I were approached by Alex to talk about our experience with Too Cool. We were deep into a routine that had us talking each week when we agreed to share our findings with you all today. I had no idea that I'd be moving to Harvard nine months later. So this afternoon, I come to you from Cambridge. Alas, I am no longer one of the cool librarians. So just an overview of how we're going to play this out today. I'll be starting out with the what and why parts of Too Cool. And then Bob will follow up with the how and now. At a library conference in 2004, Murray Shepard of the University of Waterloo spoke about what makes library collaborations work based on his successful decade-long participation as part of a three-library collaboration. He identified several elements that should be in evidence. I decided to highlight a few key ones, but suggest that anyone wanting a quick overview should take a look at his paper, Library Collaboration, What Makes It Work? I've provided the link at the, uh, in the footer of the slide, and as Kristen said, you'll have access to these slides after the presentation. So well-defined roles and relationships. Obviously, if we're entering into collaborations, we need to know what, what parts we're going to play. Um, we have to have common goals or we wouldn't be collaborating. Commitment from the top leadership I think is essential. If you don't have support, that's where the resources are going to come from. They're going to give you uh, backup if things go awry. Uh, so it's very important to have the leadership back you on your collaboration. But then you both have to be invested in the outcome. So mutual risk and shared resources are also part of it. And then finally, I wanted to point out that, uh, generally speaking, the benefit is that together you're accomplishing more than you could uh, accomplish individually. So it was a cold day in February 2009 when the leadership of both Cornell and Columbia Libraries sat together in Ithaca to assess the potential of a new working relationship. 
both library directors have been talking about the idea for months, and they concluded that where a larger group of libraries might not be nimble enough to uh, embark on such a journey, two similar institutions probably had the best chance of success. I remember that we went around the table to vote on the idea, whether the next level of leadership at the associate level had the stomach, had the passion to pursue the vision. Jim Neal, the uh, director at Columbia, often refers to Too Cool as a radical collaboration. What does that mean? When we look at the different forms of relationships libraries form, there are many C words that come to mind. And coincidentally, I noticed that Murray Shepard calls out several of the C words in his work. Coordinated collection development. Cooperative cataloging. Collaboration, consolidation. They seem to move along a continuum, one that shifts the level of independence each party retains. At one end, we have coordination and cooperation, libraries working together but acting independently. Using an example from collection development, coordination can be seen through arrangements where two libraries try to ensure broad subject or geographic coverage. One library agrees to collect deeply in a particular area, while the other agrees to focus deeply in a different area. Each institution can avoid unnecessary duplication relying on the other. Cooperation sees these two institutions share the coordinated collections. As a result, their users gain access to a broader representation of content. Or, if they decide to spend less funding collectively, they are able to access the same content for less funds. So each institution operates on its own, but does consider the other when making a purchase decision. At the other end of the continuum, there's consolidation, a merging of operations. Columbia might work with vendor X to acquire titles from Greece. Cornell uses vendor Y. They decide to consolidate their Greek acquisitions with a single vendor. At minimum, one of the institutions has agreed to forego independence by following the other's strategy. They might take this a step further and have all Greek acquisitions and cataloging handled by one institution on behalf of both. Too Cool is a collaboration. It's a package deal that embraces all of the C's. Cooperation, coordination, consolidation. Bob and I collaborated on this talk we cooperated with Alex to speak with you today. We coordinated different roles for the talk to create a message about Too Cool. And we consolidated the talk into a single program. Too Cool is described as a transformative and enduring partnership. But why do Too Cool? What it boils down to is a strategy for two libraries to do more together than either could accomplish alone. So why Columbia and Cornell? There is significant alignment between the institutions, but it's the last bullet point that's critical. The institution's leadership and libraries have the will and the interest to work together. This graphic surprised me, not because it reflects a downward trend in staffing patterns, but because Bob prepared this to reflect trends at Columbia. It is, it's almost identical to the trend at Cornell over the same time period, including time period and, and actual number of FTE. It's kind of a little bit spooky, but both libraries have reduced staffing, and we've been improving service services that we offer to our users. So we have done better with less. But at this point, we're pretty much tapped out. Together is too cool. We can continue to do better. So there are eight goals uh, that too cool outlined. As you can see, uh, quality of the collections and services is quite important. 
we needed to create the structure that would allow us to accomplish the goals. We needed to achieve a certain amount of savings so that we could uh, embark in new areas. At the first official Too Cool meeting, the group identified four functional areas as starting points. By the end of the day, our group assignments were made. We shook hands and smiled, got into our cars. We had met in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the halfway point between Columbia and Cornell, and drove back to our respective libraries. Bob can comment further, but I think it was during the first few minutes of our first weekly phone call diving into technical services that we remembered what we already knew. It's not enough that technical services staffs work together. They need to work together across functions as well. The two parties become four when technical services from each institution works with collection development. Add the technology staff and now there are six functional groups working together. So. What is technical services? Cornell and Columbia libraries share many characteristics, but they're not mirror organizations. It's important to scope out what we mean when we say technical services. Acquisitions and cataloging, check. E-resource management, check. Record maintenance, check. Batch loading, hmm. You do that in technical services? Shelf processing, check. Remote storage transfers, not access services? Preservation reformatting, huh? ILL document delivery, really? Which units are included? At Cornell, CJK is integrated into library technical services. At Columbia, there's a separate technical services operation. Does this matter? Maybe not, but it's important to understand what each party means when referring to technical services, to cataloging, to acquisitions. So remind me again, why are we doing this? Earlier this week when speaking to the Cornell Chronicle about the impact on collection building and his dual role at Columbia and Cornell, Rob Davis, the Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies librarian said, Substantially reducing duplication between two major libraries means greater depth of coverage in foreign language materials. This is the key to maintaining a rich research, rich research resource base. So should we consolidate? Again, pooling the resources allows us to free up resources to do unique things. Do we really need two or three or four ordering units, Slavic cataloging units, or directors of technical services that do the same thing essentially. Some savings can and will result simply from a re-examination of workflows and procedures across the two institutions. It's the opportunity to identify best or better practices, see them in action, and adopt or adapt as appropriate. Consolidating units with similar functions can reduce management costs and provide more effective backup for scarce skill sets. However, the greatest savings are likely to be achieved by combining truly duplicative activities. And now I hand it over to Bob. So uh, as Scott said, uh, he's going to talk, he has talked about the reasons for Too Cool, uh, the, the rationale behind it and has turned it over to me to talk about um, how we've gone about things and what we've actually been doing and, and where we think we will be going in the, in the next um, 
couple of years. I want to start out with, with a, a little bit of acknowledgement that, uh, as again, as Scott said at the beginning, um, he's made the transition to Harvard. And uh, on the technical services side of this, I'm taking the lead at Columbia, but my very able um, partners at Cornell are now Jim LeBlanc and Ching Li. And there are many more people involved in this. Uh, when we talked about this, this webinar, we thought about what to list as credits and came to the conclusion that if I started listing people, I would risk leaving people out, and uh, and that was not really something we wanted to do. So I'll just mention that many people from uh, technical services, from library systems, from collection development have been involved in what you're about to hear about and deserve a good deal of credit for their, um, their willingness, flexibility, dedication, and interest. Uh, I, I hate to start out with what may seem like a negative, but we felt this was very important to recognize that as we enter into uh, a collaboration like this, especially in a large organization that affects different people at different times in different ways, people are going to have uh, concerns. And those concerns may not always be easy to express. Uh, when your leadership is gung-ho and telling you how wonderful things are, uh, it becomes a little difficult to, to tell people what you're worried about, what you're afraid of. And so we've tried to acknowledge that these kinds of, of questions exist and to confront some of them directly and to watch for them as we, as we deal with people and, uh, and the sensitivities involved. Uh, we are, as Scott said, having to give up some things that we've become comfortable with uh, at each of our institutions and do it some other way that may not look like the best thing to, to from all perspectives as we go. And in fact, there will be some, uh, some pain and some losses in order to get longer term gains. We felt it very important that we acknowledge these things and, and build the, the, um, the recognition of the broader outcomes that we're looking for and the positive sides, but not ignore the, the difficulties of, of entering into something like this. Um, how we've gone about this collaboration, uh, we're four hours apart, and so we don't sit down in the same room every week or every day and go through uh, the details of what we need to do. Instead, we've worked a lot through wikis, putting up documents and procedures and changing them uh, collaboratively through conference calls. Uh, through video meetings, we, we have a fairly decent set of uh, equipment for each of us so that we can get small groups together in not in the same place, but face-to-face -face in a sense. But we've also found that actual face-to-face -face meetings are, are key to this. Uh, it's easy enough for, well, it's not that easy, but we've managed for the senior management to have quarterly meetings and get together to review uh, what's going on. But it's equally important for the people who need to build relationships to become comfortable working together to have those opportunities. So several of our staff at Columbia have become quite familiar with the best Western university in Ithaca, New York, and with some of the meeting rooms at Cornell. Uh, and then we found that the more we are able to do this, the more effective these distance working relationships are as we, as we proceed into detail planning. Uh, several other factors we had to acknowledge at the beginning, and I'll go through these rather quickly because some of them have been mentioned already. We are four hours apart. We have limits in how we can get together. But that also raises questions on, on how effectively we can consolidate and collaborate on things that involve the management of physical materials. At what point is it appropriate uh, and valuable enough on a, on a consolidation and on a collaboration to move large amounts of material across that kind of distance? It doesn't preclude that, but it raises that question. Uh, we do have these structural differences that Scott mentioned earlier again. They're, they're definitional differences in some cases of how we organize our units, how we define technical services, what individuals have uh, what responsibilities in their jobs, uh, administrative structures. We alluded earlier to the fact that Chinese, Japanese, and Korean uh, is supported administratively differently in our two units. And we've managed to, to work surprisingly well around those kinds of uh, differences, I believe. Um, but they do create complications. Uh, the, you'll be working with one person on a, an area and find that as you start to explore another area, it's not the same person you need to work with. So we have these shifting sets of people working on what we might see from either of our perspectives to be the same type of, of issue and, uh, and procedure. 
less obviously, perhaps, there are also cultural differences. Uh, some of them are, are very straightforward and easy to recognize, not necessarily easy to get around and deal with. Some of them are not so apparent. Uh, one of the more obvious ones is that at Columbia, our non-professional staff and technical services are part of a union, and at Cornell, they're not. Uh, that affects the way we see that job responsibilities, changes in job responsibilities, but also things like the way we use student workers and how that plays into our overall workflow and functioning. Um, we both see ourselves, I believe, as consultative organizations that like to work by consensus, that have many committees to make decisions and deal with things. Um, and that complicates processes again, because even though we are both consultative, the way that plays out in each of our institutions differs somewhat. Um, and the, the types of people involved in that consultation may be different in our two institutions. So we could get to the point where everyone needs to be involved in every decision, and we simply can't afford that in this kind of collaborative mode. So we have to keep striking this balance between uh, moving forward uh, based on a, a relatively small group of people involved and the need to engage the broader set of staff involved in the R process processes. And similarly, we have I, I think we would both believe that we have value processing efficiency, and we both believe that we value the selector role in making decisions and understanding their collections and their uh, their clientele. How that plays out in each of our institutions and how those two factors that sometimes come in conflict are, va are balanced also varies somewhat in ways that are not necessarily obvious. And the behavior is not necessarily the what we think, uh, uh, what we would say we believe in as well. So being sensitive to these differences and recognizing how they impact the way we go about thinking about things is also a factor we've had to, um, to consider as we work together. Time is a rather obvious one. Everyone has plenty to do. So even though too cool is a priority, even though too cool is recognized as important, it's not necessarily the most important thing for me on the same day that it's the most important thing for you and when you have time to deal with it. Th that's a fairly obvious factor, but again, one that plays out uh, repeatedly in our, our working together. One thing that became uh, clear early on was the value of just scheduling time to touch base. So uh, in the early days, Scott and I set up weekly calls for the two of us, even if we had no direct cool, but too cool business to talk about, just to make sure that we were covering that. And that's something that continued with the transition, uh, setting up similar time to have regular calls with Jim LeBlanc. We think that's very important to keep the relationship going. But at a fairly early stage, we encountered the recognition that we were also going to have something that I'll call technical difficulties. We want to share our work together, but we are currently working in separate systems. And that makes true sharing uh, rather difficult. So we're both using Voyager as our library management system. But we have separate Voyager instances. There are separate databases, separate sets of clients. Uh, so that if you, for instance, want to process two copies of a book, one for Cornell and one for Columbia, you really need to do essentially the same operation twice in two different systems, which reduces the possibility of, of gaining efficiencies there. Um, if we turn to e-resources, in some ways the situation is even worse. Not only are we have systems that are physically separate uh, for our e-resource management systems, our link resolvers, and so forth, they're not the same systems, and we are not using, in each case, a coherent set of a, a one suite that we can work with. So it's even more dispersed and diverse. We certainly aspire to be uh, managing a large set of e-resources together. But right now, it's, uh, again, duplicative processes if we were to try to do that. So we faced the question of uh, when we should take the, the big step of trying to work together in the same systems, to, which means change for at least one of us and possibly both of us. Uh, it's a somewhat of a catch-22, chicken-egg, horse question. Um, if we are ever able to collaborate deeply and effectively, we need to have the same systems. But the work and cost and effort to merge systems is only really justified if we actually can realize the, 
those collaborations. So around a year ago, we decided we needed to stretch the vision of Too Cool and look at a, a longer time frame, a five-year vision, to say, where do we want to be in this partnership five years from now? What are the things that we could be doing in the short term that would help us to get there? And what are the differences that we need to be reconciling in order to be prepared when the right time comes to, to move things to another phase? Uh, so we started looking at what two cool technical services might look like in 2015. It's a fairly arbitrary date, but probably a fairly realistic one as well. This is not to say we are not doing anything before then, but our target has moved a bit forward. And we started by looking at the systems environment, since that was one of the limiting factors now. What's the type of system we expect to be using once we do merge? Uh, we do plan to have a single shared system. Uh, we expect to be able to use that system to manage in a coordinated way both our print and our electronic resources and to merge the systems that are now uh, separate at each of our institutions. We uh, believe this system will be drawing on a centrally no maintained knowledge base, as, as many are now. And we can already see the examples that are uh, under development now and emerging. Uh, listed three here that we've taken fairly close looks at. Uh, there are others, certainly, that would be possibilities, such as the Sierra system from Innovative Interfaces, for example. Uh, all of these are, are developing in ways that have the promise of meeting the types of collaboration that we uh, envision and hope to be doing. Uh, and part of our exercise in the last six to nine months has been to consider in some detail uh, what that really means to be sharing a system given the way systems are developing. What are we really going to be able to do? What are the things that are still going to be limited? What are the issues we'll face in that regard? But if we get to that point where we actually are able to share systems, we need to know what it is we'll be sharing them for. What are we likely to be doing a few years out? One of the things we want to avoid is planning a deep collaboration three years from now to do the things we're doing right now, because we know things will be different then. So we've put together a paper to try to uh, envision what things will be like four years, five years ahead. Now it's four years. I haven't changed any of the bullets here of what we said a year ago, even though if we were to go through this exercise now, we would probably make some adjustments. So I'm not going to run through each of these bullets. They're there to give a sense of the types of questions uh, we're trying to, to answer. We need to know what types of collections we're going to be building. Um, the, the specific percentages, uh, we, we had a great deal of discussion. They moved up and down and changed, and they probably don't matter that much. But the key element that we came to as a conclusion is that even a few years hence, even though we will be collecting much more uh, focus in electronic form even than we are now, we will still have a fairly substantial print component. This is not something that would necessarily be true of all libraries, uh, but for the Columbia and Cornell, uh, we think it's likely to be the case. Uh, we not only need to know what it is we're going to collect, we need to have some idea of the methods we're going to use. This is a really key as we start talking about combining workflows, combining organizations and procedures. What are the things we're going to be doing to acquire materials? And once again, uh, I won't go through the specifics here. I'm more concerned about the process that we're undertaking. And finally, in addition to what we're going to collect and how we're going to get it, we need to know what kind of metadata environment we'll be working in. And we've made some assumptions there about uh, not only the standard cataloging practices that we're engaged in now, but how they might change and, uh, and shift as more types of resources become available, as standards change, as technical capabilities change. Uh, having that framework to, to be thinking about and to be acting, working against as a target, we started looking at uh, what we can do and what we need to do to prepare for that in the future. And I'm going to divide this into a couple of areas. Uh, broadly speaking, we're looking at uh, a set of procedures for print resources and a different set for electronic resources and a somewhat different form of collaboration for those two areas. In the print area, uh, we will be expecting to collaborate fairly deeply 
on some aspects and perhaps less so on others. Uh, where we can work virtually, there is some clear value in being able to combine forces. We're both running a range of batch processes now. We do it somewhat differently, but with the same ends in mind. We could certainly gain efficiencies if we managed to combine those and, and work together on this. Uh, we had each been developing tools to work around the per perimeters of the library management system of SIST processes, and we've been collaborating on some of that tool development so that we can leverage our resources in that regard. As Scott noted, we've been working on uh, converging, uh, merging the, the sources from which we get materials and data so that we are dealing more effectively with a, a, a more limited range there and can combine forces there as well, and so on down this list. And we've been looking very carefully at this question of, of physical handling and when, how far we can push the boundaries on that, where we can gain enough advantage from combining uh, combining activities to make it worth the extra cost of moving things between our institutions. And so some of the specific things we've done there or are working on, um, in the area of tool development, the, the biggest effort has gone to something we had both been working on independently, um, which is assisting the process of getting things into the, the system in the first place, moving it from an idea in a selector's head of what we want to an actual order in our library management system. Each of us had a, a component of this. Uh, we both had an idea of how we could improve what we, uh, what we were able to develop. And so we put people together to work on the code development of specifications, let Cornell work on the actual coding of this pre-order -onli online form, and then on integrating it into what are now still separate systems and workflows. The, the Without going into detail, the form itself allows selectors to enter um, some minimal information that then queries external sources such as OCLC, brings in more information, automates the decision process about vendors, generates purchase orders, and so forth. Um, this was useful not only for its outcomes, but also for the process of actually developing some concrete examples of working together and addressing some of the, uh, the issues that come up in doing that. Uh, in the area of cataloging, we've had pilots going on, first with Turkish cataloging and now much more extensively with Korean, where we are trying to uh, make the best use of the expertise in our two organizations. In these cases, Cornell has more uh, capability in the area, more capacity for original cataloging. Columbia has need for more than we're able to accomplish locally. And so we've used this as an opportunity to work out the, the issues that need to be addressed in um, uh, I'm seeing, okay, uh, the issues that might need to be addressed in, um, in having uh, the ability for one institution to catalog uh, materials on behalf of the other. Um, part of this uh, involved getting through, uh, working through some of the, the details of the workflow. Also setting up a virtual desktop so that uh, a cataloger at Cornell can be cataloging things into the Voyager system at Columbia. And then as another experiment in um, getting around this, this physical movement, many of the materials from our Korean backlog will move to our off-site storage following cataloging. And so um, that allows us to prevent having a, a double way uh, of moving things back and forth and have things moving in one direction. Um, and then finally, we have had a um, we have had a single Slavic bibliographer for some time now through Too Cool. Uh, Rob Davis acts as a Slavic bibliographer for both Columbia and Cornell, and. Um, and is able to, to act remotely for, the, for Cornell with uh, periodic visits. In order to do that, we've had to address some of these questions of having different vendors and wanting to consolidate on a single vendor uh, in each area to combine uh, approval plans, to, to uh, coordinate acquisitions, uh, to work things into our common workflow and, uh, and be able to work with these common tools so that Rob can work with one set of tools on both 
on behalf of both institutions rather than having to deal with two completely separate sets of procedures. Uh, and also what we're working on now is the ability to, um, to, to provide data that allows him to act effectively remotely, to give him intelligence that allows him to see what's coming to each institution without having to be physically present to review things. Uh, on the area of e-resources, we are doing perhaps a bit less concretely, but, uh, but imagining and working towards something that may be even more extensive. Since everything is uh, virtual in this regard, there's not the physical movement of materials, it really opens up opportunities. The other rather bizarrely wonderful thing about this is that nothing works very well now in the area of e-resources. So everything looks like an opportunity rather than a cost. And there really does seem to be some potential here. We aspire to be coordinating our licensing whenever possible. We are acquiring many of the same materials, by no means all in the electronic area. But we have done a, a comparison, a, a data dump of our two sets, and seen a lot of uh, correspondence. We would look to converge even more on that where possible. Uh, there's almost an analogy here between changing book vendors and changing suppliers for certain electronic resource content. Um, but we're looking at two different ways of, of imagining the future here. One is we will almost certainly have um, virtual units that cross the two institutions where people at one act on behalf of both. But we're still thinking through whether to make that separation based on the function that's being performed, on the type of resource, or on some combination thereof. So we might, for instance, have a two cool unit based at, let me just take for an example, Cornell, that handles uh, ebook acquisitions, processing, and, and so forth, and a different unit based at Columbia that handles databases and e-journals. Or it might be the reverse, or it might be some other combination. But clearly, there's the potential there. There's also an opportunity here for, uh, we think, extending services uh, that we can't perform now. This gets back to one of the basic functions of Too Cool, of being able to do more together than we can separately. And so in the area of e-resource problem resolution and responding to user reports of problems, uh, there's a limited staff we have at each place. They, they can't be on call 24 hours a day, all days. But by having access to the right information about both of our sets of resources, we believe that we should be able to extend that service and broaden it. Um, we won't, on these basic principles, undoubtedly follow them all the time. But where we can, where we are acquiring the same things, we'd like to coordinate that process so that we're doing it once on behalf of both with one staff performing that. And then once we've done that, we'll have the capability of maintaining the data, which is a huge uh, a resource uh, consumer for electronic resources and doing it once rather than doing it twice or, in fact, four times in separate systems. As we get into this in detail and get closer to really functioning together, um, some issues that have been present from the start become more concrete and something we need to, to think about quite, um, quite clearly. Uh, when we are merging systems, are we really talking about merging databases? Are we talking about having one database for all of our resources? Or are we talking still about having separate databases with more interaction between them, uh, staff able to work across the two databases? Or might we be looking at something like three, a Cornell set of resources, a Columbia set of resources, and then a Too Cool set of resources? Uh, it's too early to, to say for sure which way this will go. If you were to ask me today personally what I would think, I, I think we may well end up with the three, with the, with the uh, different partitions that affect each of us independently and then too cool. Uh, but that was also partly determined by what we're willing to do in terms of our access to funds and financial transactions. And that's not entirely a matter for um, the people in the library to decide. There's, there's university issues about access to funds. There's a, a different model that's likely to be in place for the way new systems interact with university financial systems. But these questions become quite critical to how we set up many of our workflows. Uh, will we allow staff at Columbia to place orders that would result in expenditure of Cornell funds and vice versa? Or we might decide that we need to have a set of two cool funds 
that is deposited in a different way. Um, these are these are questions that we're just starting to address seriously now. We've been thinking about them, but as we get more concrete about the the actual decisions we're making, we need to address those as well. And then this question of how far we can push the acting remotely. It's fairly straightforward when the actions are virtual, when we are placing orders, when we are dealing with electronic resources. But we'd like to separate as much as possible uh, functions from from physical location. So as as situations change, as more metadata becomes available on the web, as information about books becomes more prevalent and from different sources, uh, we'll look at things like, is it possible to separate original cataloging without the book in hand? Or how much do you really need in order to do that? Finally, or almost finally, we, we need to actually be specific about the business models that underlie all of this. We have two in place already, uh, and they, they may serve as models up to a point, but won't carry us through the whole level of where we aim to go. For the Slavic librarian that we have sh that we share, we simply have uh, sorted out the expectations of how much time he expects to be working on for each institution and have a memorandum of understanding affecting uh, of that, of how that time will be uh, allocated to us. For Korean cataloging, the decision is based more on the expected output, and so the, uh, the understanding governs that. But as we broaden this, and as we have entire groups of staff performing activities that are uh, on, for the benefit of both institutions, there are several ways we might look at that. And we've seen and, and have in place in other contexts examples of each of these. Um, we could try to define things based on the cost of particular activities and then measure how often that activity takes place. So we could say it takes uh, original cataloging is based on this. We measure the output for each institution and attribute costs on that basis. Uh, we might base just a more general estimate of the volume of activity that's undertaken and how it affects each of our institutions. Or we might simply say um, this this unit is uh, managing resources that, that have a, a collective expenditure for more to a, of a certain amount and uh, and base the the costs of that proportionally on, on that basis. Um, at the same time, as we deal with all of these questions, we're exploring where it makes sense to collaborate as too cool and where that isn't the right answer. We don't believe that two institution collaboration is the right answer for everything. And so we've looked at, in addition to the, the direct collaborations between us where the the aims fit within too cool. We've looked at about four different other ways of, of seeing this and our activities fitting into that. Um, some things, maybe the best answer is to outsource them. So we're working on a, a purchasing plan in China that would work for Columbia and Cornell, but in principle ought to work for others as well. And uh, we might be the, the incubator or the explorer of that type of thing that then has benefits that could accrue to many others. Other areas, we're not going to be able to uh, come up with the right answers and, and act on them ourselves uh, any more than any one library would. We need to influence what's going on in a broader community. But we might be able to act to do that. So we did a study of e-journal preservation, what's being preserved now and what isn't, and hope to use that to influence the broader uh, library community, publishing community, preservation community uh, as what, to what might happen there for, for greater benefit. And then there are things that, that we might start and incubate within our own areas uh, to test new models that go beyond one institution, but that, that again, might be uh, more effectively uh, acted on in a broader context. So we're working together on archiving websites. And, uh, and then we'll extend that into to how others are seeing this same area. And finally, we recognize there's a potential that Too Cool could offer value to others as well that we might be able to offer services that go that support our own two libraries, go, but go beyond that. As a very simple example, we're already collaborating on this Korean cataloging. There may be other libraries that would benefit from that, and we may have the collective capacity to offer a service there that would be useful to others. So the farther we get into this, the more we hope to be doing together ourselves, but also, the more we hope to be able to working with other uh, libraries, other institutions, 
to extend what's going on with Too Cool into a broader library community. And with that, um, we've got Scott on the left and Bob on the right, and we stand by to take any of your questions. And I believe I will turn the mic back over to our organizers. Hi, this is Kristen. Um, and now we have a chance to do some question and answer. And so people, you're encouraged to enter your questions into the chat panel. Um, and we do have a question here already that we can start with, where um, somebody's asking about collaborative collection development with Harvard and Yale and wondering how that experience has influenced the development of Too Cool. Um, well, I'll take that up. I'm not quite sure if there's a specific reference in mind to the collaborative collection development, but but certainly um, collection development is playing a big part in all of this. And this this actually question open actually opens up a much bigger question, which is collaboration, intersecting collaborations. Um, we've had as as Comley and Cornell uh, collaborative collection development going on through. Um, a number of specific areas, and then things like Borrow Direct, which is a group of libraries, uh, mostly in the Northeast, that collaborate on resource sharing and, and a, a, a distributed uh, delivery system. Uh, we've also got a collaboration going on at Columbia with our New York area partners of New York Public Library and uh, New York University. So. Um, that's that's another question that we keep addressing is is when does it make sense to collaborate in each of these contexts and how can we uh, be sure that when we start working together as too cool we're not disrupting and having a bad effect on some of these other partnerships uh, in principle they don't need to be uh, in, need to be in conflict and in fact we hope that they aren't um, the kinds of collaboration on collection development in Slavic that we've done between Columbia and Cornell should enrich the, the uh, these other partnerships as well, because we're now getting materials, by, by reducing duplication between the two of us, we're now getting materials that none of us have had before, and they're more broadly available to these other partners. I don't know if Scott wants to add anything to that. No, I, I think you covered it. All right. Another question that has come through is, how do you ensure that benefits accrue to both institutions equally? Um, I'm not sure that we, we've quite uh, figured that out. Uh, we, we are tracking benefits uh, just for our own, our own benefit to, to see the savings that we're accruing or the new services that we're able to provide for. Part of the, I think Bob referred to this towards the end of his presentation, the formal agreements, we're just now getting to that where we can put in writing um, what the expectations are for each party. Bob, do you want to add? The, the one thing I would add is that, that we have not um, set it as a goal that the benefits should accrue equally to each of us. Probably overall we want that to be true, but one of the things that has to be uh, possible is that in certain areas the benefits accrue more to one and then in a different area it may go more the other way. What we are trying to do, as Scott said, is to keep careful accounting of this uh, so that as the, the partnership grows and, and delves into more areas, we develop the models for how to attribute those benefits and the costs associated with them. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how have you dealt with the need to retrain staff? And following in the same training mode, how are you dealing with RDA training collaboratively? Um, I, I suppose I'll, I'll let Scott jump in as appropriately. Some of these things may be more appropriate for me to deal with what's going on right now. Um, let me take the second one first as probably the more specific one and the easier one. RDA. Um, investigation and training was one of the areas that we chose to look at early on and have collaborated on loosely, I would say, mostly by communicating with each other. Uh, the, the, the question of what kind of training we might do 
collectively is still under development. Uh, I, I don't think I have I can speak to any concrete plans there, um, but we're still working through that process. Cornell, uh, Columbia was one of the RDA test group, and we have shared experiences with that with Cornell, and um, and Cornell has been quite interested in that aspect as well. Bro more broadly, uh, I, I would say that right now we haven't had to do a great deal of retraining of staff that in a too cool context. Um, we've had to do uh, uh, maybe tweaking of training. So when we get to doing ca cataloging on behalf of each other, um, it, it's worked both directions. We've, we've adjusted procedures at Columbia to be a bit more in line with those at Cornell where the, the differences were not significant. And on the other hand, um, the people working at Cornell on behalf of Columbia have had to learn a few different details for, for our processes. But the, the major retraining is, is yet to come, I would say. We do, uh, when I was at Cornell, we did share training materials between institutions so that we, we weren't each reinventing the wheel. And that is, that's a major benefit. If somebody else has written training for a particular component, being able to take that or even have the person work with the other party in putting together another training program. That's been very beneficial. Um, we've gotten a couple questions about the budget for Too Cool and wondering how the Mellon grant monies are being used to support Too Cool and why did you feel that you needed the grant funding to explore the collaboration and then also, did you set aside specific extra budget money beyond the Mellon grant for Too Cool? Uh, I could start this one. The Mellon grant is primarily a facilitating grant. Uh, it doesn't. It, it's it's used to support travel between our two institutions to support. Um, the, the video equipment that I mentioned that helps the, the collaboration to organize planning meetings and support the travel to Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, as, as Scott alluded to earlier. It's not paying for um, extra staff work involved for the kinds of development of procedures that we're dealing with. That That's contributed by our organizations. Um, we have used it to some extent for outside consultations that facilitate this process on several areas, on business models, on um, system development and, and what the, the system's landscape and how that affects too cool. We've used it to support some staff costs and some external costs on data analysis about our collections. But it's definitely in the area of a planning grant rather than an implementation grant. Um, we are just now in the process of developing the, the next phase and saying how that will be supported and what we will need going forward in that regard. I think it's a little premature for me to, to say just what that entails. Um, but we are looking at the next phase as, as I say, a three-year phase of what we will contribute locally and where we might look for external funding. I think we would all recognize that there's, there's going to be a certain outlay in terms of staff costs um, that will increase costs for a period in order to ultimately free up resources to do other things. All right, thank you. And how did you decide on the Slavic bibliographer as your shared position? Oh, I, oh, go ahead, Bob. No, you go ahead. I was going to tell you too. I would, I'd say it was an opportunity that presented itself. Um, certainly early on in the process when there would be uh, a vacancy, uh, it, it made sense to focus there. Although in general, too cool focused on area studies, so looking at uh, Slavic and um, East Asian, South Asia, Southeast Asia. So we've started out by looking at area studies. In, in the case of Slavic, though, we had a vacancy and we had a very willing and capable uh, person at Columbia. Do you want to add anything, Bob? That, that's exactly right, and I would only add that this is just the first. Uh, we are actively working on other areas now. And on, on not one model, but on, on more than one. So um, it, it, one reason we haven't moved forward with Latin America, say, is that we both had vacancies there. We needed to fill at least one before we could look at how we would share that kind of position. Uh, in other cases, the programs are such that we believe we will still need 
a, a person working at each institution, but we might divide responsibilities differently or look for different um, different combinations of, of experience and skills in that area. Uh, so I saw the, the question about the Slavic bibliographer also asked, asked about how we are addressing non-collection development needs about support for reference, faculty services, and so forth. And that, that's a whole other topic, of course, but, but the agreement certainly goes into great detail on that as well. And um, Rob makes periodic visits to Cornell, meets with the faculty, knows them. It's been, I, I have to say, and can say in all good conscience, a wild success on both campuses so far. There was a recent uh, survey of, of that experience with the Cornell user community, and the, out, the outcome that I saw reported was entirely positive. All right, thank you. Um, do you see challenges with um, your systems vendor, Voyager, in moving to your one system, or are you looking, or is that where you're kind of opening it up to looking at all sorts of different possibilities in the future? Uh, the answer to that is both. Uh, I think there would be challenges with any system vendor to, to implementing the kinds of things that we want to do as too cool, uh, just as there will be challenges for any library making a system transition. Uh, we are working with Ex Libris at this point on, on the details of this. We have not closed off other possibilities and are looking at all the others as well. So. Um, there are certainly challenges. I don't know that anybody has all the answers at this point, including Columbia and Cornell. One of the, it's got to be a, a, a back and forth process. Uh, the vendors need to know what we want to do and also what we're prepared to do. And we need to make those decisions based on what's going to be possible to do. So one of the, the big outlying questions is whether Too Cool needs to at some point become a separate business entity that can sign contracts and make expenditures. We're not there by any means, but that's a question that, that's still out there uh, and that ties into the way systems will be implemented. All right, thank you. And how do you plan on measuring success of Too Cool? Um, there, there are a number of ways that we are measuring success and more that we will in future. Uh, and there's not a very, um, you know, we don't have a matrix yet for this. We are measuring it rather concretely in terms of cost savings or savings that we've been able to redirect to other areas. And so while those are not that extensive yet, um, certainly we can point to things like the Slavic bibliographer situation, like the, the cataloging that we're doing uh, on each other's behalf, um, uh, like the, the external buying plans we're implementing, that will result or are resulting in, in cost savings. So, so that's one measure of success. It's quite clear so far that we are also looking at where those costs get redeployed. So what we're able to do that we couldn't do before. Um, that's measured both in terms of staff activities, but also in terms of uh, the effect on our collections. As, as, when Scott looked at goals, improving collections was one of those. So we're starting to look. It's a little early to be able to get um, precise measures, but we're starting to look at how have our collections become less duplicative and more broad as a result of the kinds of collaborations we're doing. Um, there, will be, there are also softer measures of success that are equally important or perhaps even more that uh, we haven't really addressed yet but, but we're thinking about and that would be in the reception that to the perceptions of too cool on our campuses uh, is this seen as a good thing as having accomplished certain goals as well. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I know there's some more out there that we haven't gotten to yet, but we will be sending out um, the questions to Scott and Bob so they can take a look at them. But finally, at this point, do you consider this to be a permanent arrangement or is it still an experiment? I think Scott's being quiet now because he doesn't want to, I should probably be the one speaking to some of these things. We've always viewed Too Cool as a permanent arrangement that may turn out not to be permanent. Um, we have to, if we're going to get anywhere, we have to view it as a, a, a 
something that has serious backing behind it. So our assumption is it will continue. Uh, it will go on. We plan on that basis. But we also have to recognize the possibility that it won't, and that we'll look at this in a few, some period of time and say, um, the, the original intent is no longer there. The premises on which it was based are no longer there. Our two institutions have changed a lot. Um, so, so I would say we're looking on it as a permanent arrangement, but we're also building into it the possibility that it, not, it either completely goes away or changes. And I think changes is probably more likely than goes away. I saw one of the questions related to, um, to you know, if, if we give up uh, having a, a capacity to do something at one of our institutions and then things change, how do we rebuild that capacity? Um, it's, it's a question that we have to be thinking about but, and, and making some plans for, but we also have to uh, uh, not, not be held up by that too much. Uh, that I realize that's a, a rather imprecise answer, but um, that's the best I can do at the moment. And that's, that's what I would say. We, we were more interested in moving forward and getting started. We understood that we, you know, it wasn't necessarily a, a marriage forever. We had to, we have to think about what happens if we need to go our separate ways. And that would be part of a business, uh, a review of, of a, a formal agreement, which hasn't, I think, Bob, you were talking about, uh, we are starting to look there. We don't, there's no formal agreement as of yet um, governing the two cool as an organization. There are memor memorandum of understanding for specific pieces, uh, but that is a business case and the, and the business surrounding Too Cool and its life cycle um, is certainly something that needs to be developed. All right, thank you. I hate to cut off the um, discussion, but it is time to end the webinar. Um, the last thing that I just like to um, people to know if um, you found the session useful and you're interested in doing some other webinars. Um, this is our final webinar that Alexa is doing for the fall season, but we have more webinars that are being scheduled for next winter, and a lot of information is already going up on the website. We also welcome suggestions for webinars and any other continuing education opportunities, and again, if you follow that link on your screen, you can suggest webinar topics um, on the Alexa website. And, and thanks both to Scott and Bob for describing the challenges of Too Cool. And I apologize that I originally called it the Less Cool to See Well. I should have asked you if it was a pronounced acronym or a spelled out one. And thank you for all the attendees, and I hope that you found this useful. You'll soon receive a short online evaluation form, so please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. We do receive these comments in the Elect CE Committee, and we use them to plan additional continuing educational offerings. And lastly, um, before we sign off, I'd like to thank Yuan Lee, who helped provide technical support for today's webinar, and Cindy Hepfer, who helped organize it. And they and all the colleagues on the CE committees help keep these webinars running smoothly and help us get new ideas. So thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we hope that you'll participate in some other webinars in the future. Goodbye. <laughs>